Father, I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. You alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So over the last few Sundays, we have gotten to know King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, this king who was the greatest king of the second uh, great Babylonian empire, he ruled for 43 years. Uh, which is hard for us to fathom. We're used to four or eight year cycles. But he built Babylon into the greatest city at the time the world had ever known. He was famous for his military exploits, massive building projects, and extravagant art. Uh, he built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the ancient uh, wonder, seven wonders of the ancient world. He beautified the blue walls of Babylon, the Ishtar Gate. Um, other lists actually put that as another one of the ancient wonders. And so far, he has largely been the enemy of God's people, as we've been reading through uh, the book of Daniel. Um, we have seen his rage. Uh, we have seen his pettiness, his idolatry on full display. But you've had these little hints throughout He's beginning to recognize who God might be, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, certainly, his extended favor towards Daniel and his friends, um, they keep getting promoted within his imperial administration. And last week, I suggested that as we read through Daniel and consider how to flourish in exile, uh, we shouldn't only consider how God's people respond to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon we should also consider how we can see ourselves in Nebuchadnezzar, um, how he shows us the universal human uh, condition. Um, and, and what I said last week, and I really think it's true, is that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, man, he just has enough money and power to externalize the brokenness within all of us. Um, and that's unchecked for him. Um, but this morning is our last chapter with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4. Um, this is going to be our last time with this great and terrible man that we can all relate to. And you might notice that Daniel 4 is bookended by the praise of Nebuchadnezzar. He comes to recognize uh, the God most high, but the path to get there, he's going to learn a lesson um, that is fearsome to behold, the remedy for the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. So I want to look at this, this long chapter together, Daniel 4 and really break it into two main sections. Uh, first, we have fair warning given to Nebuchadnezzar, and then we have the hard lesson that he learns. Fair warning, and then a hard lesson. So if we look at this, we know that this king, this uh, ruler, he wanted for nothing. He had everything that the world could offer. And he gives his testimony here in Daniel 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house, and prospering in my palace. He is literally on top of the world. Um, many of us know that that doesn't bring happiness, but we'd still like to try. <laughs> Go ahead and switch it up. Let's just try it for a day, a week. Who knows how it would be uh, to be Nebuchadnezzar. Um, worldly prosperity and success mark his life. Um, and we know that these are seductive things for uh, God's people. Uh, they tempt us to rely on ourselves instead of relying and depending on God alone and merely being grateful for the good things that God places uh, in our lives. Prosperity is a trap for Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and I, I remember some of you probably read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Um, he has this senior uh, demon writing to his young, inexperienced nephew, here's how to trip up this young Christian and he talks about prosperity. Here's what Lewis writes. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it while really it is finding its place in him. Goes on to say real worldliness is a work of time, assisted, of course, by pride. We see this in Nebuchadnezzar. He is prosperous and he is prideful. Um, it's, it's against what we hear in 1 John. Uh, 1 John, we hear in the New Testament, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. Um, and we'll talk about this more, but I actually think when we find ourselves in a place of exile, one of the greatest gifts is how that frees our hands from the world because we're not in charge and things aren't going the way that we want them to go and they turn us often uh, to look to the Lord and depend on him rather than our own hands. Uh, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. <laughs> uh, John writes that actually to those following the Lord who are tempted by worldliness. Uh, but this is the other side of the coin. We, we see in this chapter um, Nebuchadnezzar's real conversion. And it's worth asking, um, how do those who excel in this world even recognize their need for God? What's it look like for the Nebuchadnezzars of the world to come to faith, to have any kind of need uh, shining in their lives? Well, what we see here in Daniel 4 is a pretty reliable pattern of how God reaches out to everybody and how sometimes it's a moment of hardship and they'll actually bring the person to recognize God most high. Um, and so think about Daniel 4. Um, we come here, this is going to be the second dream Nebuchadnezzar has had. Um, but just the fact that God is sending dreams to Nebuchadnezzar is remarkable. He's reaching out. He's trying to teach him and make himself known. Um, he has sent Daniel and his friends uh, to Babylon as a real gift for Nebuchadnezzar. They've been speaking uh, into his life in many ways. Um, and here we're going to see just how far the Lord will go to reach Nebuchadnezzar, including the willingness to teach him a hard lesson for his own ultimate good that we can learn from as well. Um, Daniel 4 verse 5 is evidence of God's love and pursuit even of this uh, enemy uh, king. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, I, I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. I've often said the task of preaching is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Here, Nebuchadnezzar is as comfortable as you can imagine, and the Lord afflicts him. First with dreams, he's restless, and then eventually what we'll see play out in uh, Daniel chapter 4. Um, he's afflicted with a dream. And we're told that none of the Babylonians can interpret the dream. Um, I actually think maybe they were just unwilling to speak up and say what they discerned was going on in the dream. It's not that hard to figure out this is a bad deal uh, for Nebuchadnezzar. But so he'll reach out to Daniel because he'd already seen in Daniel chapter 2, hey, this guy, there's something here. There's something special. Um, there's a unique ability. Somehow God is on this man's side, so he turns to him uh, for the interpretation. And again, the dream is vivid. It's terrifying. Um, it starts with this worldwide tree of life and of blessing. Um, if you read it, uh, it might have actually sounded like one of Jesus' parables. Did you hear an echo there? Did it remind you of anything in the New Testament? Um, Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. It's that kind of tree, this worldwide thing. And we shouldn't be surprised that we find that echo because this whole book in many ways um, is about God establishing his kingdom that will replace and surpass and outlast every great kingdom and society the world has ever known. Now, what happens to this great tree in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is pretty scary. Uh, we're told that a watcher comes. Um, this is one of those, those angels um, that, that is about the Lord's work, and they come down with an announcement to bring the tree down, cut it down, chop it down to its stump. Um, he does say, hey, leave the stump. Um, and that, that little stump in the ground is the sign of both humiliation, but a small, hey, something could grow from here. And we, we have that in Isaiah. The stump of Jesse's line, from that comes forth actually the Messiah later. It's all this imagery of the prophets we see crashing together. Um, and all of a sudden, we thought we were talking about a tree uh, being chopped down, but if you notice, it all turns into these personal pronouns. This tree is a person. It's representing 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And what we hear is going to be, whoo, man, it's tough. Um, this, this man will be afflicted. There will be this dehumanizing, humiliating period of time for this king that he will go through. Um, and we're told that he's going to be driven out. Um, that he'll have the dew uh, on his, in other words, he's not going to sleep indoors. He'll sleep outside. So the morning dew comes on him and he gets these funky talon claws because he's there so long and his hair uh, grows wild. And the angelic messenger makes it really clear why this is going to happen. He says, so that, and this is what it says in Daniel 4, the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. God is teaching not just Nebuchadnezzar a lesson here. Um, he's teaching all of the world a lesson uh, with what will happen to this great king. Um, before we get to that, I want to linger for just a moment on Daniel, uh, this man in this passage, because you might assume that he would be pretty excited about this news. Uh, remember, this is the man, Nebuchadnezzar, um, who had gone to uh, Jerusalem, gone to Judah, and taken him and his friends away. Later, this man goes to Jerusalem and destroys the city and destroys the temple. This man is arrogant and proud and violent. At the last chapter, he tried to burn Daniel's friends alive. You might think he would be thrilled. This man is finally going to get his comeuppance. But that's not what we see. Uh, Daniel in this passage is dismayed. He's upset. He actually said, hey, I wish this was for one of your enemies, not for you. He is faithful then to tell the king what he needed to hear instead of what he would have wanted to hear. And uh, Christopher Wright, he's got a book called Hearing the Message of Daniel. We've been going through it um, as we've been studying this passage. And he writes this, once again, we should marvel at the fact that Daniel so freely, so willingly, so competently served the man who had destroyed his homeland devastated his city, and deported his people. We could hardly have a more practical example of love your enemies in Old Testament dress. Later on, he says he could have, Daniel could have sunk into a life of permanent bitterness and a disgruntled antagonistic attitude toward his Babylonian employers and neighbors, but he did not do that. And because he had not made himself unpopular with those around him, he was now able to speak a word from God to this troubled pagan king. Um, there's a lesson here when we find ourselves in a type of exile. Um, how do we actually care for those who are our enemies? How do we remain present to possibly be used of the Lord to speak a word that is timely and needed? Um, can we even be aware that part of our own discomfort could be so that we could serve those making us uncomfortable? We see that here in the book of Daniel. And by the way, Daniel doesn't just interpret the dream. If you notice, he actually holds out a suggestion for Nebuchadnezzar, which is pretty bold. Like this is King Nebuchadnezzar. And he goes, hey, like perhaps repent. <laughs> and he holds out the way of Micah the prophet to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Hey, all of your violence, the way you treat the poor, all of these things, maybe, maybe don't do that. And maybe this won't happen. That's Daniel's suggestion. Uh, but we're going to see, and that's a pretty fair warning, right? I mean, you get a dream. You get an interpretation. You have Daniel calling you to repentance. Fair warning before this hard lesson that we had in our reading today. Because uh, all this happens in the Lord's goodness and wisdom and perfect timing. But it's interesting. Verse 29 it says, at the end of 12 months, so a year passes, and I, I do, I, this is where I like to fill in the blanks a little bit. I mean, is Nebuchadnezzar, did he repent for a year? Or was he like, well, I've been waiting a year, none of that happened, I think I'm in the clear. <laughs> I mean, where is his headspace here? Uh, well, what we're told uh, is that at least a year later, we see this moment of pride for him. He is walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and he goes, I'm something. 
No, he says, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. Look what my hands have done. Now, I'm sure his hands didn't even swing a hammer. But look what my hands have done. Look what my mighty power has accomplished. And instead of a year delay, we have immediately, while the words are still in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. And they tell him, hey, here's what's going to happen. Just like the fair warning you were given for seven uh, periods of time, this great and prideful king will be humiliated and dehumanized like an animal. And to underscore it, we're told, uh, Daniel 4, verse 33, immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. It's a pretty scary image. Um, and I will say, this is where I do think that a lot of our contemporary uh, preachers and theologians drop the ball a little bit. If you read about this passage, um, <laughs> there's so much time uh, trying to make this plausible by appealing to the DSM. You guys know what the DSM is? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And they try to pinpoint where we can find this in the DSM so that we can assume God must have done this. And you're like, God just like brought three people out of a furnace. In Daniel 3, God can do whatever God wants. Um, and, and you read these passages and they'll actually tell you, hey, what's probably happening, um, this is uh, lycanthropy. Or it's boanthropy, a human thinking that they are an ox. And I read one theologian, he wanted us to know this is probably true, because he visited a mental institution in early 20th century Britain, and there was someone who thought he was an ox. Therefore, this must be true of Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm like, man, what are we doing here? Like, first of all, like, there are folks that have struggles. That's not what's happening here. Um, this is a specific lesson that God is teaching. Um, and, and we don't know exactly, we're not told exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. We're just told um, that this is not a generic bout of mental illness. This is a specific judgment and lesson uh, for this king and for all the world. He's reduced to this animal-like existence. It's subhuman. It's less than human. And I think that's what's key here. If you read through the Old Testament, um, we, we learn that humanity is created in the image of God. And we have this vocation to fulfill, and part of it is actually to, to rule, um, to order things rightly. Um, and when we don't do that, when we instead sin individually, um, or in, in systems, sin together, what well, we're told, it's subhuman. It's dehumanizing. Um, later in the book of Daniel, there's all these beasts that will appear representing these evil kingdoms of the world. Um, I don't think we're being told here that Nebuchadnezzar was afflicted with a bout of boanthropy. I think we're supposed to see that this man uh, who through his pride and sin was giving himself a, to, to be dehumanized, it just becomes manifest. And the kingdom he was overseeing that was acting like a beast, well, he is reduced to that state. It's just God revealing uh, what is within uh, to everybody so we can see it. That's what's happening here um, to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and that's actually in contrast, and this is getting way ahead, but in Daniel 7, this is all building up to Daniel 7, where we see this image of this perfect human, the Son of Man, whose rule is everlasting. Uh, they're setting up this contrast between Nebuchadnezzar and uh, the Son of Man, who we know as the Lord Jesus. That's what's happening in this book overall. Um, I would say if you want to appeal to some contemporary examples to figure out what's happening, uh, man, shut, shut the DSM and look at some film and literature. Give you just a couple of examples. Um, how many here are familiar with the Lord of the Rings? Yes, I knew I was in the right church today. All right. Um, there is a creature in the Lord of the Rings called Gollum. 
You might know the creature Gollum. Um, we're told early on he used to be human-like, like a hobbit. But he commits some terrible sin and murder. And, and centuries of sin and isolation and this ring he had and a mixture of self-centeredness and self-loathing had turned him into something animal-like that evoked pity. Um, I actually think maybe if you imagine Gollum scurrying around Mordor, um, that's pretty similar to Nebuchadnezzar in this passage and the way he has actually been reduced to a less than human state. Or uh, moving from the Lord of the Rings to C.S. Lewis, who I mentioned earlier. Um, I know some of our fourth and fifth graders, they're gonna do a book club. They're gonna be looking at some of C.S. Lewis's works and one of those is The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And there's a young man named Eustace Scrub, and he almost deserved that kind of name. And we're told he's a very greedy young man. And one day he finds himself on a dragon's hoard of gold. He's thinking dragon thoughts, and he goes to sleep, and he wakes up, and he's a dragon. Again, everything inside of him is now externalized for the whole world to see. Um, and in that particular passage, he's not able to undragon himself. He has to rely on Aslan, the Christ figure, to come and actually transform him back into a human, which is pretty relevant for our passage uh, today. Um, or finally, my favorite example of this has to be from the Emperor's New Groove. <laughs> Am I, is this the right room for this? Yeah? You guys know the Emperor's New Groove? It is a Disney animated film. It is a fantastic film. Um, you should go home and watch it this afternoon if you haven't gotten it already. Um, I rewatched it this week and forgot that this was the movie that gave us the term boom baby. <laughs> and I don't make deals with peasants. Um, those were like staples in our house when Noah was growing up. <laughs> My son, boom baby, and I don't make deals with peasants. Um, we would tell him to do something, and he would suggest another alternative route. And I would say, I don't make deals with peasants. <laughs> it's just how we parented. Uh, I don't know if that's right, Father Bill. <laughs> okay, anyways. Um, well, in the Emperor's New Groove, you have, uh, it's set in, the, in Peru, the Incan Empire. Um, and you have the Emperor Cusco, this young, um, prideful, he doesn't care about anyone else, especially the poor, and he eventually is turned into a llama for a season until he learns the lesson and we see this transformation in him. Again, you see this theme throughout uh, film and literature where um, you have someone who needs to learn a hard lesson and it's through being transformed that they learn it. Um, one Old Testament scholar, Dale Ralph Davis, he summarized this passage he says that certain times in our lives, God may have to take us through a lot to get our attention. We may not like what we experience at the time, but it may be the very best thing for us. The real goal of life is not being at ease and flourishing. Rather, it is intimately knowing God. He goes on to say, for we are all a bunch of Nebuchadnezzar clones wanting to call our own shots, to direct our own show, and seldom except in rare moments of sanity do we stop to consider how asinine our passion for self-deification is. That's the lesson of this passage. And so uh, notice that Daniel 4 um, doesn't linger very long on Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation. There's a really long buildup with the fair warning there's a hard lesson and it comes immediately with the moment of ultimate pride and hubris. And then before we know it, God's at work. And God restores Nebuchadnezzar. And we hear his testimony, this beautiful, surprising testimony. Daniel 4, 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? See, reason returns to Nebuchadnezzar. 
he is put back on his throne to finish well. And the last thing we're going to hear from this great and terrible man is his testimony, his praise to God Almighty, who got his attention through this hard lesson. He says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. And so, um, Daniel 4, you have this bookend. The first few verses are praise from Nebuchadnezzar, then he tells his testimony, and he finishes with praise. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, this pagan king praising God. And a few things just to point out as we close. Um, one is we see that not only have Daniel and his friends flourished in exile, but they have been part of God's mission to the nations through being displaced and uncomfortable. They've been part of God's mission and bearing witness to this man, Nebuchadnezzar, who was their enemy. Um, and how incredible that Nebuchadnezzar tells this story publicly. I mean, he's a king, he's a, he's a ruler. Um, you probably would like slide this into a classified folder and hide it if you had gone through this, but he wants the world to know um, who God is and what God had taught him. And so we have this uh, incredible testimony from him. Um, and finally, as remarkable as this story is, it shows us how God is able to humble those who walk in sinful pride. Um, how much more remarkable um, to consider the Lord Jesus? Because every time you see a king, every time you see a ruler in the scriptures, um, they're held up in comparison to Jesus. And so you have this King Nebuchadnezzar, he's filled with pride and he's brought low like an animal. Well, the Lord Jesus, um, well, he would have had every right to be filled with pride in the best sense of the word. Instead of God having to bring him low, we're told that he chose to lower himself to come among us for you and for me, for our salvation out of his great love. And we're told that Nebuchadnezzar, who had to learn humility and become like an animal, we're told that the Lord Jesus exemplified humility. And he too became like an animal. What does John the Baptist say the second he sees him? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's set up here um, as a contrast for us. The Lord Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man, became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world because of his obedience to the Father, his great love for you and for me, and he invites us to follow him in the new and better way of the kingdom of God rather than following the ways and kingdoms of this world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.